All right, Tim, tell us about photos. All right, so uh, this class for the library is about, in general, uh, photography, uh, some tricks and tips and general knowledge on how to take them, um, what device you can take photos on, and how to save those photos so you don't lose them later on. Um, yep. So we have a couple slides uh, that deal with like composition and lighting. Um, and then we also will go over some tools or programs that you can use to edit your photos afterwards and, you know, how to back up your photos so you don't lose them, which in my opinion is probably the most important part. All right. Photography has a whole bunch of rules. If you look online for photography how to's, there are a plethora of top 10 rules of photography that'll make you better, et cetera, et cetera. Um, not all rules were made to be broken, but in a, like a lot of other aspects of life, it's good to know the rules uh, before you decide to break them. And then we have two examples, which I'm sure since they're both literary references, Mary is enjoying right now. Absolutely. All right. In my opinion, uh, the most important thing about photography is just taking photos. Sounds really stupid, but sometimes people will get so in their head on thinking that they have to take a perfect photo that they will spend a lot of time not taking the photo and just trying to figure out what would be best, where to go, where to position before they even start taking photos. I just say just take photos because at the end of the day, you'll look at the photos afterwards and you'll kind of see what works, what doesn't work, and you'll learn what works for you. Uh, what some people might consider a great photo, uh, you would not consider a great photo. It's kind of like movies or TV shows or books. Just because someone else says it's the best book ever does not mean that you're going to enjoy it. So some things to look at would be you want to look at the lighting. So if the if the sun is right above you at noon, then the lighting is all going to be pointed straight down, which will give sharp uh, sharp shadows. So if you want like a more dramatic photo or something of that nature, um, then you can do it at noontime when you're going to have really, really sharp shadows. Um, if you take a photo either in the morning or in the evening, you'll get what's called the golden hour, which is kind of where most people say uh, that an individual's skin tone will look the best, the most lifelike, and just it'll give you those like soft shadows, which are aesthetically pleasing. Um, as always, try different angles. We have a slide that kind of goes over that a little bit more. Um, if you are using a camera or a phone and you are tempted to zoom in to get a better shot, try physically moving closer, especially with something like a camera phone. Whenever they do the zoom feature at a certain point, generally past 2x, at a certain point, you're not really zooming in so much as you're cropping what the image would have been. So by move by physically moving closer, you're more likely to get a better shot with more detail. If you're taking photos of people, um, we've all seen the stock photos or just taken photos of friends and family where it doesn't look natural at all. You go to review it and you know, Everyone has this member of their friends or family who has the exact same face they make in every single photo they've ever taken or they're ever in. So you just want to make the person comfortable or group of people comfortable. I generally do it by either making them so embarrassed that they break character mm -hmm. or making a joke that finally lands. Um, you can also do this by, you know, giving them props. Uh, the rule of thirds, if you imagine a piece of paper with it split into thirds horizontally and vertically. Aesthetically, people say that if you photograph, if you take photos of things that are along one of those lines 
it'll be more pleasing. Generally, what this means is you don't want someone like or something at the very just at the very top of the screen or just at the very bottom or to the side. You kind of want them framed in that little window of thirds. And the last thing on the slide is use a tripod. Unless you are a surgeon that has never used any tools or aids to steady your hand, taking a photo, you are with your bare hands, you're gonna introduce some vibration, some shifting. You're just not able to hold perfectly still. And if you want your camera to capture the best image, you wanna be as still as possible. And the best way to do that is to use a tripod. Um, the other things you can do are just physically put your camera on something that isn't going to move. Mm -hmm. But you basically want to introduce as little vibration as possible. And a tripod is a great way to do that. Plus, one of the benefits of a tripod, at least for taking photos of people, are you can raise it and lower it. So you can guarantee that it's going to be at the level that you want it to be. Whereas if you need to find an object, Sometimes it'll be too high or too low. This is an example of lighting. Um, I found this one decently helpful. Uh, you may not see as much difference as I would like, depending on the, you know, the streaming quality. But the bottom row shows you where the photographer has put paper to soften the light or obscure the light or make it indirect would be another term. And then above that shows you what the girl's face looks like when that type of lighting is applied. The most notable one for me is second from the right, where her face kind of just has an overall glow. You can tell that because the light is diffused through that paper, it kind of softens everything and makes the face look very natural and without any shadows. Because if you look at that one compared to the one on the left or the right, or any of the other ones really, her face doesn't really have any shadows and it has a more mm -hmm. uniform color because light is not bouncing to get to her. It's just kind of diffused through the paper. This is also why in some older movies or just if you're around like a particularly beautiful spot in town and you notice like a professional taking photos, this is why they have those umbrella looking things. Has anyone ever ever seen those or am I yep. am I going absolutely crazy? No, no there are a lot of nodding in the classroom. Okay. Because I remember whenever I was in uh, Vienna, everyone was like an amateur photographer there. So everyone had these umbrella stands in every single garden I went to. And they were just projecting light, you know, diffusing light at whoever they were taking a photo of. You're talking about Vienna, Virginia, right? <laughs> yes, Virginia. The the his well-known and historic, beautiful Eastern <laughs> or European city of, of Virginia. <laughs> Angles. Uh, so obviously any of this can be applied for people, places, things. I personally really like taking photos of flowers. I think it is probably the manliest thing you can take photos of, so I really enjoy it. Um, and when you're taking photos of things, you have to worry about the angle. Now, in general, very general, if you take a photo of someone from above them, uh, the image will generally be considered more flattering. But And this is because it kind of helps uh, make that jawline. So unless you're an absolutely ripped specimen of a human, like I am not, um, your jawline is kind of not going to be very straight. So if you take a photo of someone from above, their jawline is naturally going to have that sharp edge, which is generally aesthetically pleading, pleasing. The negative thing about taking photos from someone from above is, and this is super pseudoscience, but I swear, look at headshots for people in companies and get back to me. So if you take a photo of someone where you, where the camera is higher than the person, it will make them look less dominant. If you take a photo of someone and the camera is underneath that person, it will make them look more dominant. It will project power. 
So if you go to a website or if you see in the news a photo of like a president or something like that, oftentimes on like official, like their official headshot will be shot from below to give them that like aura of dominance or strength. It's a fun thing you can play. So anyway, um, this slide, you can definitely reference it later. This kind of gives you some or verbiage on what the difference is between above, with the camera above, the camera straight on, or the camera below, and kind of what these different locations are going to give you the illusion of equipment. Equipment is not as important as I will make it seem, mainly because if anyone remembers that photo of the uh, workers on the steel beam, mm -hmm. that was from what, like the 1960s? And that's a, or, you know, wh wherever. It, it wasn't, you know, the past 10 years. Let's put it that way. Um, and it is objectively a great photo. It's beautiful. And it's very artistic. And any camera you pick up today that turns on is probably going to be a better quality camera than what that person took the photo with. So equipment is not incredibly important or as important as just going out there, learning, playing around, and taking photos on your own. That being said, I'm more than willing to tell you equipment. So if you have a small business or something like an Etsy shop, I would highly recommend something like a light box. So what a light box allows you to do is it allows you to put an object inside of it and create perfect lighting or lighting that you want to um, fine tune and make sure that it will look perfect every single time you take a photo. So if you're taking a photo of a lot of different like bowls, for some reason, if you, if you make bowls, um, you can make sure that the lighting on your website for every single photo is the same. So it's very clear that it was professionally done. The next thing is a light diffuser. We kind of talked about it. Uh, a simple example of that is those umbrellas that kind of diffuse the light. The reason why you want to diffuse the light is it gives that soft glow of light as opposed to the harsh shadows that direct light will give. The next thing is a bag. This is just to carry your stuff and to make sure that it's padded enough to make sure that your camera does not break all the time. Uh, you'll want a flash. This is generally for low light photography. You can ignore it if you have like a light diffuser or something super fancy. You'll want an extra memory card. So with a physical camera that you hold that isn't your phone, um, you'll have memory cards that you can plug in, take photos, and the photos will be stored to the memory card. Two things you don't want to have happen. You don't want to be shooting for a week and run out of space. And you also don't want your memory card to die, and then you'd be unable to take more photos. So just carry an extra memory card. You can get them for, you know, a couple of them for under $50. So it's it's a fairly cheap way to make sure that you can keep taking photos and that you don't run out of space. Uh, lens filters. I have a link to a website that really goes over lens filters and what they do. Um, most importantly, it can get rid of glare on things like water, which is very nice. Um, and the, the link I have in there goes over the different types and what type of lens filter to use for what. This is an example of a light box. As you can see, you put the object in it. It creates a very nice glow effect around it. So the object is very easy to see. All right, so the camera. Um, are there any questions so far before I delve into the most expensive part of this? Any questions for that? Okay. No, nope, we're all set. Perfect. All right. So there are a couple different types of cameras. Uh, there is a DSLR. Those are the big ones. 
Those are the expensive ones. There is a compact camera, which still allows you to change out the lenses um, and is a little bit less expensive than a DSLR. We have a pocket camera, which is what used to be extremely popular. Those are the tiny ones that you can, as they're named, fit in your pocket. And you have your phone, which is very quickly becoming the camera that everyone has on them. Uh, Mary alluded to it earlier, but the best camera in the world for you is the one that you have on you. I have a very fancy, very expensive, very nice DSLR, and I don't take it with me because it's really heavy, it's really expensive, and it's just kind of annoying to carry with me on a regular basis. So I always have my phone on me. So my phone is what I use to take most of my photos. Jim, what does a DSLR stand for? What are those? Uh, let me Google it. <laughs> it's one of those things that I swear I used to know. And then, you know. I can do that. It's also one of those things where I'm probably going to make it up in my head and get like three of the words right. Digital single lens reflex camera. There we go. Um, there's also mirrorless now, which based on their size are about the same quality as a good DSLR. Okay. Uh, they take a little bit more battery, but we'll ignore that. Mm -hmm. So this is just a slide where it kind of shows you the difference between full frame versus other types of frame sizes. The more expensive DL DSLRs or mirrorless cameras will be full frame. And you can see that by the red square, which is the entirety of the, Im of the image. The next one are APS-C, and then which is in blue, micro four thirds, which is in yellow. Uh, generally, the blue and the yellow are what you're going to get on your entry level uh, DSLRs, you know, that are about you know, $500 to $1,000, you're going to get that size. And then this is an older image. So the phone cameras are better now, but a smartphone or a smaller camera, like a pocket size camera are going to be that tiny green square. And what this is showing you is that with a full frame camera, you're collecting much more of a picture. than with a small camera. The other thing a full frame will allow you to do is collect in more light, which will make the image crisper and way better in the evenings, afternoons, nights, whenever you're not, whenever you don't have perfect, absolutely perfect lighting. Um, so full frame has better frame of field of view. This lets you capture more of a scene with the same focal length versus smaller sensors. And the pixel density is better because you have more of an opening for light to get to. So you have more light per pixel, it means that each individ individual pixels will be quote unquote better. They'll have a better time of receiving information. Prices. Uh, full frame, you're looking at about $2,000 to get a good one. The Sony Alpha 7, is that 6? 4. Not very good with Roman numerals. All right. So full frame will be about $2,000. APS-C, which is not full frame, uh, will be starting at about $1,000. And then the smaller pocket-sized ones will be under $1,000. You'll be able to find cameras all over the price range, but these are just, you know, general generalities here. Um, if you buy expensive cameras, you will also need to buy expensive lenses. So for a full-frame lens, you're looking at over $1,000 to start. Lenses can go in for tens of thousands of dollars. For APS-C, you will generally find the same lens for cheaper. And if you buy a smaller camera than that, you won't be able to change the lens, which is why I have a sad face. Um, or I could have a happy face for your bank account. 
for phones, uh, these are the two phones that I would consider to have the best cameras. Um, it's six of one half dozen of the other. The iPhone 14 Pro is starts starts at $1,000. And the Google Pixel 7 Pro starts at $700. Both of these will take great photos. The main limitation for phones and taking photos is the how far away from something you can be. If you're taking photos of friends and family for a holiday, uh, these will be fantastic. If you are trying to take a photo of a goat or deer or moose you saw that's 100 yards away, it's not going to be as good as a really nice camera. It'll never be as good as a really nice camera, but you will start to really see the difference in quality uh, whenever you start to kind of try and take photos of things that are further away. Whenever you buy something, um, in person is good. There, we have a local Peterborough camera store. They're very knowledgeable. They will also ship out your UPS packages. Uh, I guess that's a bonus. And But if you're buying online, um, two good stores are bhphotovideo.com, so b and h photovideo.com, and amazon.com. The reason why these two are nice is the first one is specifically for, or started specifically for camera gear. They also have a pretty good return policy in case something is broken. The second one is Amazon, which everyone has used anyway. And it also has a very wide selection of products. So these are some quick sheets on some of the fancier settings you can change on a camera uh, for different types of photographs. Before we do that, does anyone have any questions on the physical aspect of buying, owning, or using something? No, we're all set. You're providing a lot of information for us. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, this, this, we're going over this fairly quickly. Uh, there will be time for questions at the end, you know, all that fun stuff. Um, but one of the important things, as always, is we will provide these slides to you, which you can reference uh, later in case I'm speaking too fast. So for portraits, the aperture mode, you want it to be wide, which would be a f2.8 to a f5.6, depending on your lens. This will give you shallow depth of field. This will make it so that the person you are taking the photo of is very clearly the subject of the photo. The things in the foreground and in the background will appear blurry. This will make sure that the focus is on the person. If you do the opposite of this, everything will be in focus, and then it is hard to tell where the, per wh the person viewing the photograph, it is hard to tell where they should be looking. Also, uh, your shutter speed should be fairly fast in general. For macro photography, this is kind of my favorite. This deals a little bit more with uh, flowers. Um, a tripod or monopod is extremely useful because you want to have very clear images. And also when you're photographing something that is small, oftentimes any sort of wind will blow the subject in different directions. It will move it. So you want your camera to be as still as possible to slightly compensate for that. You'll want a very fast shutter speed. Again, this is so that if something is moving, you'll be able to capture it. You'll want a high aperture. This is so that everything is in focus. Uh, you can use flash if you need to. And you'll want to, if you use flash or an outside source of light, you'll want to change the exposure two or three stops. So plus two or plus three. Um, if the thing is moving in a predictable way, you can move the camera to keep it in focus. The other way is to um, on different cameras have different methods of focusing them. But what you can do on most cameras, 
and this is specifically for a flower, as an example, is there is the center part of the flower, you know, like with the, I am completely blanking on what the center part of the flower is called. But if you want something to be in focus, what you can do is you can move that to the very center of the camera, hold down the button to take the photo about halfway that will lock the focus in if you're using autofocus. You can then move the camera, but the focus will stay there. And then you can finish taking the photo. I feel like that explanation um, makes a lot more sense if you're holding a camera. So next time you're holding a camera, uh, look at that. A lot of cameras these days uh, will have different spots on the screen, which will show a square that will show that you can autofocus to one of those squares. So you can make sure one of those squares is over your subject, click on it, and that will autofocus to that point in the camera's viewfinder, the thing you look at. Um, this is if you have low magnification, so similar. Landscape, uh, the most important thing with taking a landscape photo, so this is like, we live in New Hampshire, which is absolutely beautiful. And certain times of the year, it is very impressive with the color you can get in the trees and things of that nature. So if you're taking a photo of landscape, um, I would highly recommend you use a tripod and then just play around with it. So take a lot of photos. Um, if you look up a how-to guide, uh, they will tell you to do the exact opposite of what the next guide will tell you. So I would recommend just take photos with different settings and see what you like best for a certain situation. Um, I also have linked a tutorial specifically for mountains. Um, another thing is if you're in the White Mountains or near the White Mountains and you want to take a class, uh, specifically for landscapes, there's a dude called Jerry Monkman, who's very good. He's a landscape uh, photographer that primarily works in the Northeast, and he has been known to run classes in the White Mountains before. Um, the next thing is to just look at tutorials. So we're going to go more into this in a little bit, uh, but we, we will come back and click on some of these links. Um, if we have, if time allows, slash, if people want to. I will point out that Peter Hurley, the middle option, is my absolute favorite uh, tutorial I've ever seen for taking headshots of people. It's funny, engaging, and like 12 years old, and I have yet to find anything better. So I really like that one. It's also like 10 minutes long, so I can't actually show it to you guys right now. Um, I personally find that I learn more from seeing a bad photo and someone explaining to me why it is bad than I do by someone explaining to me why a photo is good. So that is what these examples are, where you can click on them, and then it will kind of go through and explain why a certain photo is bad. Uh, and we'll click on one of these in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Right. Whenever you are editing something, if you want to take photos, fantastic. Once the photo is taken, if you want to do any editing on them, uh, you don't have to necessarily pay money to edit your photos to be good. Here is a list of uh, some free tools that are very comparable to things like Photoshop. Um, the main thing you're going to get with a program like Photoshop is you will get support. Uh, also, tons of professionals are using it. So a lot of tutorials on how to edit a photo are using are teaching someone how to edit a photo using Photoshop specifically. So you may find a tutorial on how to edit a photo that looks really cool. And if you're using one of these free tools, it will not be as easy to follow along 
because the tutorial is made for a paid program like Photoshop. That being said, uh, some of the best ones on this list personally are Pixlr, P-I-X-L-R. Um, the next one that's probably the best would be the Adobe Express, which is basically a pared down version of Adobe Elements, which is a pared down version of Adobe Photoshop, mainly because you'll find things in a lot of the same places in the tutorials, so it's fairly easy to follow along. But all of these are good. Uh, special mention for Canva, uh, mainly because the library uses it. Uh, but the reason why Canva is really special is if you are doing any sort of marketing or product photography or websites, anything like that, Canva is very useful because one, it has an AI component, which you can use, uh, but mainly because it was first and foremost created to make photos be a certain size so that they would fit perfectly on Facebook, which is now called Meta, or perfectly on Twitter, or perfectly for the banner of a website. So this is a very good tool for sizing your photos. They also have some limited photo editing included, um, and there is a free version. So if you are looking to design a website, maintain a website, put your photos on social media, Canva is a very nice tool to do that. If you want to edit on your phone, I would highly recommend you don't do that. Um, but if you insist, uh, here are some tools. Uh, Camera 360, Snapseed has not been updated since like 2014, but it's still one of the better ones, which should show you the quality of tool that you're working with with phones. And then uh, Photoshop Express. So Photoshop Express is essentially Photoshop for your phone. Obviously, it is not very full featured comparatively but it is all right and it is also very popular. So there are tutorials for it, which is a theme you'll hear me saying. If you use the free tools or if you just are like me and if you pay for something, you're more likely to use it because otherwise your guilt keeps you awake at night, you can buy something. Um, Adobe Photoshop is $19.99 a month. And it also comes with Lightroom. Uh, Lightroom is kind of for organizing your photos and doing workflows and stuff like that. But the main reason to get Adobe Photoshop is because it's the OG. Everything is compared to Adobe. If every other service is comparing to a different service, um, then you should probably look at that different service, just like with cars. If everything's comparing itself to the Toyota Corolla or Honda Civic, those are probably the two cars that are the most reliable, for example. Um, and it's $20 a month. Uh, Portrait Professional is one I actually use. I very much like it. It is specifically for editing people's faces for portrait photography. And it makes it very, very quick and easy to edit those types of photos of people. Um, if you want to be different, the Nick Collection from DxO is very nice. It is a different way of editing. That means that you will feel uh, superior to every one of those normal people who you know, just uses Photoshop like a sheep. Uh, the next one is Affinity. Affinity is very nice because it's essentially as close as possible as they could uh, get to Photoshop without being sued by Adobe. So a lot of things that work on Photoshop will also work on Affinity. Plus, it is $70 one time. So you buy it this year, and you will still be able to use it in five years and not having paid more money. Uh, Skylum makes Luminar AI. Um, it has some AI elements to it. You kind of put photos in and tell the AI to do its thing, which for some people may be a, an advantage. And Topaz Labs is nice if you want um something to process your photos and make them higher quality if that doesn't make sense then uh probably don't need it 
All right, storage, which is the second part of this, is how to kind of make sure that your photos are saved in a way that if you lose your computer or if something else happens, you don't lose the photos. Uh, before we talk about that, are there any questions on applications for editing photos? Do these, um, these applications look familiar? Have you used any of them before? Oh, we could have a lot of exploring to do then. Go ahead, Tim. I have a question. If he has a recommendation of uh, something where you can add text to, to photos or draw. Canva. 100%. Canva. Canva. Okay. Yep. Uh, the reason why I say Canva is uh, there's a free version of it um, that allows you to do things like that very quickly and very easily. Um, you can technically use any of the programs listed to add things like text. But that's kind of what Canva was created for, was creating like banners of websites that would add text over a photo. It's just their bread and butter is what they're very good at. So I would pick Canva. It's also what the library uses for that exact reason. All right. Storage. So storage is the most exciting thing uh, I will ever talk about. And because of that, we have three different classes on storage. Uh, this one I would count as half a class. So if you want to store your photos, you can store them in many, many, many different ways. Some of those ways would be using Flickr, which is a photography storage site. Uh, one of my personal favorites is 500 pixels. Uh, we'll go over in a little bit why 500 pixels is really nice. But you get unlimited photos for $4 a month, which isn't too bad. You have SmugMug, which is one of those services that allows you to take your photos and easily apply them to things like GIFs. So putting them on a ball cap, putting them on a calendar, uh, on Christmas cards, that kind of thing. And they also throw in uh, photo storage, and that is $13 a month or $110 a year because no one can do math. We have Google Photos, which if you pay for storage already, uh, will for Google Drive, Google Photos will work fantastic. If you don't want to pay for it, Google Photos will store something like a, over 100,000 photos uh, for free, roughly. So still fantastic. And then the one that I use is Amazon Prime Photos, because if you already have an Amazon Prime subscription, you automatically get Amazon Prime photos for free. So that's why for free is has a question mark. Do we, we have, have a question? Yeah. Yep. Uh, when you say photos, uh, does that include videos? It does not. You get five gigabytes of uh, free video storage with Amazon, um, but it does not treat <laughs> videos and photos as the same thing. Uh, the only thing that would really store videos that is on this list uh, would be Google Photos, and that's purely because if you're paying for storage for it, you can also just throw the videos in um, with the photos, and it just counts against the storage. Um, so final thoughts, if you can only remember three things, uh, shoot multiple pictures from multiple angles and pick out your favorite later. We are no longer shooting on film unless you are. Also, we are no longer shooting on glass plates anymore unless you are. Props to you. That's awesome. So just take hundreds of photos. Whenever you get home, look at them on your computer screen, which is much bigger than your phone, and delete 90% of them and keep the ones that you like. Um, one important thing I found when editing a photo is to continually look back at the original image. Uh, if you're familiar with the adage of uh, a frog goes into a pot of water, you can 
turn the heat up and eventually the frog will boil to death and the frog won't jump out. That's a flawed study, but we'll pretend it's real. Um, a similar thing will happen when you're editing a photo or you will make an edit. You will compare it to just before and think that's a good edit. And you'll keep doing that a couple of times. Uh, but if you look at the original image and the final image side by side, it may look kind of weird or unnatural. So just remember to keep back going to the original image to make sure you haven't turned someone's you know, skin a weird color or something of that nature. And the last one is the best camera is the one that's with you. So for many people, that's their phone. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I, one of the very rare times when I'll tell people to buy things would be their phone if they want to take photos because it's a very easy way to um, kind of just take better photos is to is to buy a new cell phone. Uh, before we get into questions, I said I was going to click on a couple of things. So uh, one of my favorite things about 500 picks is their tutorials section. So again, we'll send you this uh, this slide show. So we will go to the tutorial section, and they have tutorials written by um, professionals. So you can go to their tutorials page, step-by-step uh, -step beginner's guide to photographing your first webbing, wedding, uh, how to light photos for portraits, how to take a picture of a baby, how to take pictures of cats, and then you can click on one, and then they will kind of go through and explain the premise and explain how to do it. They will also tell you what camera settings to have for this specific tutorial. So I highly encourage 500 picks at least for their tutorial section. And there are, are tons and tons of tutorials. There are 24 pages of nine. So I'm really bad at math, but that's, a lot. What, like 200 tutorials or whatever um, that are very nice. The other thing that's nice about 500 picks, and I really hope this isn't a not safe for work image at the top, perfect, is if you look at Discover, you can kind of find, oh, they hide it for me. That's very nice of them. There was one time we were doing a class and I was showing people a website and whoops, all right, so one of the nice things about 500 picks is you can look at what's popular today or you can see editor's choice or something of that nature. But you can look at this photo of a bird and say, I would really like to do that. So you click on the image. Uh, of course, this one I pick is not gonna show it. Of course, but in a lot of these, what will happen, if I can find a right one, is uh, people will post their camera and their um, settings they used to get the photo. So you can kind of look at it and see what they did. And of course, again, I click on a bad one. You're going to have to trust me on that. Okay. But you can just look at photos and... Get inspiration. Let's sell, let's say that. We're going to ignore that that just failed a little bit. Okay. So 500 picks is really good for that. Um, once again, Peter Hurley. This is very nice. Uh, this is a course, quote unquote, by Shopify um, on how to take photos of products in order to sell them. Uh, and example, examples of what not to do. Again, I find it useful to see things that are bad in order to improve. Uh, if we click on this link, good and bad photos of the most beautiful places in the world. So we're going to make this page a little bit bigger. And this is just an example. Uh, the Sea of Stars, which look absolutely beautiful in the photo on the right. 
and not great on the photo on the left. So this just kind of gives you an idea of the photo on the left is bad, the photo on the right is good. Photo on the right, you can see that they waited until the sun was lower so that the photoplankton are, or the bioluminescence is much brighter. They got closer to the water, so it looked brighter, but it kind of gives you an idea of, you know, the photo on the left, if you looked at it, you're like, that's kind of cool. Photo on the right, in my opinion, is absolutely stunning. So same location, probably the same camera, just waiting 10 minutes and slightly putting the camera closer to the water ends up with a much better photo. Next one, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but next one, uh, the photo on the left. I mean, it's kind of obvious, but the photo on the left has people in it. The photo on the right does not. The photo on the right, in my opinion, looks a lot better because it just, you know, it kind of looks nice. The purple is over the entire top. It's very aesthetic. There's no people in the shot, which are quote unquote ruining the shot, all that kind of thing. So good photo, bad photo. You can go through and see different opinions on what makes good and bad photos. And we have a couple of those. All right, so I'm officially done talking. I have taken up at least 45 minutes of your life with my voice. Uh, does anyone have any questions, comments, or anything of that nature? We have one person who is taking photos with her iPhone and they're syncing to the cloud and she's having trouble. She wants to get rid of, she's having storage problems on her phone, but if she, tries to get rid of a, a photo on her phone, it's going to remove it from the iCloud. Yes. So whenever you remove a photo um, from your phone and your phone is syncing with a cloud service, such as iCloud, such as Google Photos, such as Amazon Photos, um, there will be an option if, you, if you're on an iPhone, I think if you long press a little bit more or if you just hit delete, there should be a, an option that comes up that says remove from device or remove from iCloud. And you would just have to select the remove from device option if you want to keep it in iCloud. The other way to look at that is um, they're probably not running too low on space if they're trying to remove it from their phone versus their iCloud uh, because Apple has its auto magical uh, storage solution thing that will automatically offload things such as photos from your device where all you will end up seeing is the thumbnail until you click on it okay. as a way to save space on your iPhone, iPad, or Mac computer. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Tim? I was also, I'm sort of amused. I was thinking about all of the, um, the lenses and when you get to the phone, if you're taking the phone, it just gives you a portrait or, um, low light. So it automatically determines what those, um, those calculations are. So I yeah. thought it's pretty interesting. And the other thing with uh, phones are you are able to install uh, photography apps on your phone, not for editing, but for initially taking the photo, where it will allow you to manually adjust a lot of those values, okay. whereas in general, your cell phone will try and do uh, automatic adjustment for you. The yeah. biggest automatic adjustment is the portrait modes on both the iPhone and Android phones which will uh, sort of artificially blur not the person in order to give you that perspective of the low aperture um, or the, the bokeh. Well, thank you. Uh, yes. Is there an app that uh, can add a polarizing effect, polarizing filter? Here, let me... Um,
I think it's called Moment. Yeah. So if you're looking to get more, quote unquote, out of your phone camera, yeah. uh, one of the things you can do is you can go to Moment, M-O-M-E-N-T, and it's not cheap, uh, but they provide lenses and filters and covers for your phone. So if you wanted a filter, for example, yeah. um, you can get the Cinebloom phone filter bundle with the lens, a couple different lens types for, you know, $55. They also sell um, uh, phone cases themselves that I'm obviously not going to find immediately, but you can buy a phone case specifically for your phone type, and then they will have lenses or attachments that will go directly on the phone. So you can do things like, um, like put a polarizing filter on it, or even a macro lens on it, or a, you know whatever lens you want. Um, again, these are not cheap. Uh, if you look at this, it has an anamorphic mobile lens uh, for $100. So it is fairly expensive, uh, but they are very well made. So moment. All right. Thank you. So you've given us a lot. I'm, I'm going to encourage everyone to play and then to come back on Wednesdays from 12 to 1 with your questions and problems, because Tim's here for tech drop-in, and he's more than happy to help you. So, so thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.